Hi there, welcome to IndyCar. It is, what, the 13th of uh, March today, and um, I'm broadcasting this actually at almost exactly the same time as the BBC News, partly just to annoy the BBC, but partly because I know everybody's probably just having their lunch at this time of day. Now, there's a lot of things happening in the news at the moment which you may not hear about, and one of those things which... Um, appeared on the National today. I'm not going to uh, give the news in exactly the same order as I've, uh, I've put it in the preamble today. But one of the most important things I think that's come out in the news today is a joint letter by the First Ministers of both uh, Scotland and Wales. That's Mark Drakeford and uh, the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, who have asked the, the UK government to permit Scotland and Wales to take in uh, up to 4,000 refugees from the Ukrainian war. Now, in the case of Scotland, that would be 3,000 for Scotland, which is uh, fair enough because Scotland is a, a larger country and is able to take more refugees and about 1,000 for Wales. Now, the idea of this is a, what's known as a super sponsorship. Um, the new Tory government's uh, proposal for uh, bringing more Ukrainians in through the bizarrely complicated and vastly over-bureaucratic hostile environment immigration system is for both governments to sponsor thousands of people at a time. And by using the Foreign Office, which uh, the Foreign and Immigration Office can supply the names of Ukrainians who are at, at the moment applying for UK refugee status, we can obviously sponsor whoever whoever's names are put forward first. The idea of this is not, uh, as the Tories are expecting, for individual families to come forward and sponsor individuals and families from the Ukraine, although that will still be possible. This is for the governments of Scotland and Wales, uh, in conjunction with their local authorities and the third sector, the, the uh, voluntary sector, uh, to provide accommodation and shelter uh, food and other essential uh, daily um, needs for families coming to Scotland and Wales from the Ukraine on the basis of uh, using these uh, large institutions to provide vast numbers of people with accommodation. Now, before you start howling, oh, well, we're a small country, we can't take thousands of refugees, which is often the way the Tories portray this kind of situation, we have to remember that under international law, we have an obligation uh, to take in refugees when they are seeking shelter from war, famine, uh, and persecution. And in order to do that, we need to be able to do this more quickly. And this idea of uh, super sponsorship by both of the two governments would enable that to happen very quickly and allow us to take large numbers of Ukrainian, desperate Ukrainian families who are fleeing persecution, who are fleeing a war, uh, and who have nowhere else to go uh, to find safe haven here in Scotland and in Wales. Now, in doing so, the Scottish government is basically trying to use the new system that the Tories have put in place in the most efficient way possible. The Conservative government has said that they will offer £350 per month to anyone who volunteers to take in a refugee family. Now, if that funding is directed to local authorities, then that money can also be used in order to help this happen more quickly. Now remember, these are refugees, these are not migrants, they're not coming here to take our jobs, they're not coming here to settle, they are here because they have to come here, there is nowhere else for them to go. And to my mind, this is a vastly uh, simpler way of achieving what seemed impossible only last week, with the, the UK system being so stupid and so anti-refugee, that this is one way of getting these uh, thousands of these refugees into safe places as quickly as possible. Now, it's, it remains to be seen whether the United Kingdom government uh, accepts this proposal. I can't see why they shouldn't, because it's using their own system, it's uh, using their existing bureaucracy, they still will do the checks on individuals coming in through the system, and all those who are passed as uh, refugees who who can prove their identity and so on will get through the system that will be allocated places if this proposal goes ahead. Now, Michael Gove was interviewed yesterday and he was um, asked about the system and although he was expressing his concern about the safety of refugees, he was also asked a hard question about whether he would be prepared uh, to provide accommodation for a family who are fleeing Ukraine himself and he actually said yes, which 
to his credit for a change, uh, Michael Gove actually proved that he does have some kind of conscience, although he said he had certain things to sort out before that could be done. So it goes to show you that even people like Michael Gove, when they put on the spot like this, are forced into thinking about other people for a change. However, I think this is a sign, if we need a sign, of the humanity which is <laughs> endemic in Scotland and Wales in the systems that we have and in welcoming refugees here uh, who have no place else to go, who need a safe haven, who will be accepted, who will be fed and become part of our uh, part of our communities on a temporary basis until they're able to go home. Now, other things that have been happening recently, you've probably already read about this, but um, recently I announced that the First Minister had re well, basically restated her commitment to holding the independence referendum in 2023. She said she was not going to be blown off course and the events in the Ukraine uh, and the Russian invasion were not going to change those plans. We've now heard from Patrick Harvey, the co-leader of the Scottish Green Party, that uh, they expect, and this is the Green Party saying this, they expect the uh, the secondary legislation, that is the Scottish Independence Referendum Bill, to be published imminently. Now that means sometime in the next few weeks, I would imagine. Uh, and that, uh, according to the Greens, they are also expecting the referendum to go ahead as planned. More evidence, I think, that um, with the Greens also being in government, remember Patrick Harvey is a minister in the Scottish government, he cannot make a statement like that unless something like this is happening, because he would easily be found out if it wasn't happening. And I'm sure that um, in conjunction with the SNP part of the government, the Greens are reiterating what has already been said before, that the independence referendum still will go ahead. It has to go ahead because, as I've mentioned many times before, we still live in what passes for a democracy, and if we live in a democracy, we are entitled to vote on the future of our country. And asking people whether they wish to remain part of the Union does not in any way cause the Union to dissolve. It's simply a poll of people's opinions. Therefore, it doesn't contain anything in the, the Scottish Referendum Bill which compels the United Kingdom to repeal the Acts of Union. And therefore, it is, in everybody's opinion that I've spoken to, still a perfectly legitimate way of gauging uh, the Scottish people's reaction to recent events and the changes that have occurred in Scotland since 2014 and allows them to express their opinion about whether they wish to remain in the Union or not. Now, advisory is a word which is used for all referendums. In fact, the referendum on uh, staying in or leaving the European Union in 2016 was advisory. The British government chose to make it uh, binding by accepting the result of it as a democratic will of the people of the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. So you have to expect that once we have an advisory referendum in Scotland, if we decide that we do not wish to remain in the United Kingdom Union, then the British government has to do something about that, even if it is not compelled under the referendum, uh, the Scottish Referendum, the Scottish Independence Referendum uh, Act to do so. So there is nothing in our referendum bill which is in any way beyond the competence of Holyrood because it does not affect the Union uh, physically. The United Kingdom could refuse to accept uh, any yes vote that was achieved using this referendum. And as I've said many times, if the uh, Better Together side, the Unionist side in Scotland, were to boycott such a vote, they would simply be abdicating responsibility. And that would mean that they would have to accept the result because they chose not to vote no. If a Unionist doesn't want Scotland to leave the Union, then they should vote no. If they don't vote no, then they're basically saying that they don't mind about what the result is because that is the way that democracy works. And it's always worked that way, and it works that way in referendums, it works that way in the elections, and there's no reason why it should stop working that way. Now, just one more item to mention to you, and that is the COVID figures for this week so far. Uh, and it's been uh, revealed today by the Office for National Statistics and by um, the Scottish NHS that the figures for new cases of COVID-19 have risen to 13,000 per day. Now, this is a big jump. It has been gradually creeping up ever since the Scottish Government 
and Scottish NHS decided that they would include PCR tests and lateral flow tests in the statistics. Now, the lateral flow tests are the ones that we can take at home, which give us a result in half an hour. And if we combine the results of both of those tests, then the figures are higher. And therefore, we're seeing a jump in figures. However, it is expected that there would be a jump in figures as the restrictions are relaxed across the United Kingdom. And Scotland is relaxing its mask wearing rules as of the 21st of this month. We're still uh, compelled by law to wear masks in shops and in closed spaces and workplaces. And that will continue until the 21st of March. However, I think the fact that the figures are not going down, even if they have climbed slightly because of a change in the way that the figures are compiled, we can see that um, the, the virus is still active amongst us and it is still causing sickness. Although it looks as though at the moment hospitalizations, although they have risen slightly, it is not resulting in a higher death rate than we've seen in the past. So we're hoping that COVID, although it's still here, is not going to rise any further, but it is indicative of two things. That is, when you remove the restrictions, cases will increase. The, the numbers of infections per day, new infections will increase. They are increasing across the United Kingdom and actually have increased a lot more than we're hearing here. In fact, we're not hearing anything really about the COVID cases in England and Wales because we know they're rising and they're rising faster than they are in Scotland at the moment. I don't have the exact figures on that, but the last time I looked, there was a jump in figures in England, and it was exceeding that in Scotland. The only reason, as I've said before, that Scottish figures are climbing higher than they were in previous weeks is because of a change in the way the statistics are compiled, and that is now combining the results of PCR and lateral flow tests in the statistics. So. The situation is still quite fluid, but I think you can see the direction in which things are going politically in Scotland is towards the referendum. The two parties in government, the Greens and the SNP, are in lockstep. They're continuing preparations to, uh, to publish the Scottish independence referendum bill. There are some legal uh, hoops that need to be gone through. Basically, these are procedural um, steps that need to be taken before a bill is presented to Holyrood, but these are expected to be completed before April so that the First Minister can then announce the date on which the uh, bill will be presented. And at the moment, we do not have a date in mind for the referendum. Now, the SNP and Green government can suggest a date, but it would be down at the moment, as far as I understand it, to Parliament to decide on whether that date is appropriate when they have a vote on the legislation. Once the legislation is passed at Holyrood, and it was expected to pass because the government, the uh, joint Green and SNP government, has a majority in the House, then that becomes law, and that means the way is clear for the referendum to take place. Now, regardless of what happens in Ukraine, it would be nice to think that the uh, First Ministers of Scotland and Wales get their wish, and Scotland is permitted to use the bizarre system of immigration which is being forced upon the Ukrainian refugees to take as many as possible. 3,000 refugees um, in a country the size of Scotland with about 5.5 million people is equal to one single refugee for every 1,800 Scots. Now, if you keep that in proportion, you're talking about less than a tenth of 1% of the population is coming under this scheme. They are not being brought here to take anybody's jobs, as I've said before. They're being brought here as a humanitarian act to provide them with a safe place on a temporary basis until it's safe for them to return home. I don't see a problem with this. Um, the fact that Michael Gove has come out and said that he is prepared to provide accommodation for refugees is interesting. And I would hope that if Gove is actually true to his word, that these um, proposals coming from the First Ministers of Wales and Scotland will be accepted by the UK government, allowing 4,000 needy families who are desperately needing accommodation in a safe place will be able to find a safe place here. Anyway, that's my uh, programme for today. I know that um, Indy, Indy, I know that Indy Truck Davy doesn't 
tend to broadcast on a Sunday because of his high workload. So we'll see Davey again tomorrow, I'm sure. But in the meantime, I hope that uh, you'll be able to make do with what I'm providing for you today. Anyway, in the meantime, if you have any suggestions or criticisms or any reactions at all to the news today, let me know in the usual way. I'll be back again tomorrow uh, trying to give you any pertinent news with regards to Scotland, which you're not hearing in the mainstream media. We rely, of course, very heavily on the national um, and other news outlets here in Scotland to provide the kind of news which the, the British establishment refuses to provide for us. You'll notice that the Ukrainian war is distracting everyone's attention away from the fuel crisis which is going on at the moment. If you're interested in knowing why the uh, fuel bills are going so high, please read the, the tweets and posts of um, Professor Richard Murphy, who is an expert uh, on the, legal, uh, on the uh, economics of the uh, situation here in the United Kingdom. And he basically explodes the myth that there is no way to control the price of fuel. It is a choice being made by the oil companies and the gas companies at the moment. Uh, they are not actually producing less oil or less gas. It's not because of the scarcity. The Russians have not turned off the gas taps yet either. The reason why the fuel prices are rising and you can check this uh, again with uh, Professor uh, Murphy's uh, post. But the reason for it is the fact that people are panic buying large amounts of fuel on the international fuel markets and forcing the price up. It is nothing at all to do with the scarcity of oil and gas. So we are basically being forced to pay higher prices simply because of panic buying in the world fuel markets. The British government could do a lot about this. Um, they could tax the oil companies for a start. They could force them to reduce prices. We know that EDF Energy, which is um, a majority uh, French state-owned uh, company in France have forced the, well actually have been forced by the French government to cap their price increase to 4%. Whereas EDF customers in Britain have their fuel price capped, their increase capped at 54%. So let that sink in. In the United Kingdom, we are paying 50% more than people in France for energy from exactly the same provider, EDF Energy goes to show you the difference in the ways the United Kingdom goes about its taxation of oil and gas companies and the way the French go about it. If we had done the same thing as France, and we had a big stake in our oil and gas industry owned by the Scottish government, we could force uh, the producers to lower their prices as well. But we can't. And we can't do that until we are independent. The only way we're going to be independent as if the legislation is published uh, in the next few weeks at Holyrood and it's passed and we hold a referendum so that we can decide to become independent and actually force our energy uh, companies to comply. Anyway, that's it for me. I'll see you again tomorrow. In the meantime, enjoy the sunshine where you have it. Uh, I believe it's supposed to be a little bit stormy today, but um, it's not a bad day here in Glasgow. So get out and about in the sunshine and get some exercise. I'll see you again tomorrow. All the best. Bye for now.